kind of lightly referred to it as Barbie boot camp. So they told me the deficiencies or the problems in the facility, but they also were quick to say, you know, a few of them, this, you know, this is Barbie boot camp because we know about the overcrowding in the huge um, city prisons. In terms of the prison composition, the majority are nonviolent offenders with sentences of four to seven years, and about 73% are in there for involvement with drugs or money crimes. The students in my class, so this is Intro to Women's Studies, are about one-third first year. They come from all different majors, and only a few of them have ever thought about social justice issues before taking this class. Prior to the trip, students had read a prison memoir, Orange is the New Black, which is quite different from the TV series. It, the TV series is loosely based on the book, but the students quickly realized that that's much more, the book is much more of a social justice document. St students were keen to make their own observations on prison life, and so they, they appeared to appreciate the upcoming trip. You know, it's a general education class. They weren't applauding, but they were, they were interested. But I should tell you, too, that they had very strong opinions of what prison life should be. Just before we left, about a day before we left, a heated discussion broke out. Some people said it was unfair to treat prisoners, prison as more than a warehouse, and other people argued strongly that it was a rehabilitation center. So students approached the trip from a variety of contexts. Now, the video assignment allowed students to pursue their own interests, their own theme, and the only requirement was that it be roughly three to four minutes and not solely walk us through our trip. Um, so I'm going to show you two videos, and the first one um, is a comparison. The students chose to compare social justice issues as they surface in Danbury Correctional Center, which both the TV series and book are based on, um, and then also comparing them, of course, with the Wyoming Women's Center in Lusk. And even though the students used images from the TV show, I just want to remind you they are talking about the book. After reading Orange is the New Black by Piper Kerman and visiting the Wyoming Women's Center in Lusk, Wyoming, we learned that there are very many similarities and differences in social justice concerns. In terms of overcrowding, Piper states that she does not find an issue with cell space, but when it comes to gatherings and activities, there was a slight concern of overpopulation. She felt like she had to spend a lot of time in her cell because that's where she wasn't disturbed. She could read, write, and sleep without having to worry about bumping elbows with another inmate. In Lusk, many women said that they were lucky that they only had one other roommate. The women said that overcrowding wasn't an issue. In some prisons, violence contributes to many controversies. In Orange is the New Black, she explains that although she never felt threatened, there were multiple opportunities where others showed intimidation. For example, at the beginning of Piper's 15-month sentence, she accidentally badmouths Pop's cooking. She is threatened, but later shows her loyalty to the chef. Being strategic about your click choices turns out to be a viable plan for surviving prison. In Lusk, the prisoners stated that prison is a lot like high school but worse. Women are catty, so verbal violence is prevalent, but fights are rare. If an issue occurs, the women involved lose their privileges and many think it's not worth it. Health provisions in everyday society continue to improve, but in the prison world, health concerns and other health policies remain stagnant. Piper Presents Crazy Eyes is a down-to-earth woman with some psychological issues. Dan Barry ignores these issues, but Piper finds it both interesting and concerning. She explains that all the doctors working at Dan Barry either didn't have a clue or didn't care about the inmates other than the gynecologist. At the Wyoming Women's Center, there were far more options for the mentally ill. The Prison Community Partnership Committee is offered to both non-mental health patients and mentally ill patients to contribute provisions that will help better policies associated with these issues. Another option offered for troubled prisoners is the Wyoming State Penitentiary Complex in the High Security Special Needs Prison. Both can be used to transport the incarcerated to a better facility that can accommodate to their needs. In contrast, health provisions continue to advance. In both Danbury and the Women's Center, there are structured physical health maintenance classes like yoga with Jeanette and Darla. Exercise classes are planned and run by inmates, and many said it's a nice break from work and day-to-day -day prison life. 
Rehab for many is difficult and relapse rate can be high. Once prison is added, addiction treatment is a struggle and some find themselves incarcerated again. Piper demonstrates this by explaining what going down the hill means. When the women were almost done with their sentence, they were sent down the hill to the drug treatment program. Although it is a type of rehabilitation for inmates, many felt as if there was no transition period and many ended up back in prison. Similarly, the Lusk women felt that there was no help offered. Drug addicts usually ended up back in prison regardless by either violating their probation or using again. Human dignity and the rights of prisoners continues to be debated. Piper felt violated when being strip searched and when she had to squat and cough after self-surrendering. In Lusk, almost all the women said that some correctional officers treated them as if they were normal people, and some treated them like animals. But regardless of the perception of the officers, the women still felt like they were treated as if they were below them. Although the American prison system still needs some work, many laws, prisoners, and citizens are trying to transform the facilities into high-functioning rehabilitation centers. Some social justice concerns include overcrowding, safety of inmates and correctional officers, mental health and physical health, substance addiction treatment, and human dignity. After visiting Lusk and reading Orange is the New Black, we are more educated and concerned about the issues with prisons today. Okay, so scrupulously organized, um, visually provocative and also you know with an emphasis on transformation and rehabilitation um, several other videos talked more about people's preconception about the actual inmates um, one gentleman's talked about how he saw people who reminded him of his relatives and family members and friends and said you know at, by the end of the video he actually kind of mocked his idea that they were going to look like the don't do meth posters um, and similarly, the following video explores how strongly ingrained associations are splintered by even just a few hours spent with inmates. What is prison to you guys? Prison when uh, we don't have any rights. Prison is where felons go, and they stay there for a long time, and yeah, people get raped in there, and that's why I'll never go there. It's hell. Okay, I know this first part is really soft, it gets louder. Um, these two gentlemen um, are in the same major as the gentleman who made the movie, and they just basically went up to them and said, what, 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 do you, what comes to mind when you think of prisoners? And they said, oh, you're locked up for life, felons. And then um, one gentleman said, lesbians. And then the other one in the orange shirt is about to say, oh, I sort of see it as like a really loving place. They all get along. So you get the, immediately these two stereotypes of um, lesbian woman in prison and a very cutified, like, oh, love must be in the air because it's a bunch of women. That's what you get right at the beginning of this. How do you guys think that a woman's prison would differ from a from a man from a man's prison? Uh, there's more love. They get, get they get along together, you know. <laughs> what? I'm serious. Uh, and what I used to watch uh, locked up, and they get along together. They uh, they're fun. One of the first inmates we met while visiting the last prison was a young lady lady named Darla. Uh, while hearing her story from our tour guide Chris and watching her almost break into tears really made me realize that these are normal people. All it takes to wind up in prison is to be in the wrong crowd or and in the wrong spot at the wrong time. Walking through the corridors of the prisons, it made me realize that these are normal people that the only difference between us and them is the orange jumpsuit. And they didn't look like prisoners. They they could easily have been mothers, cousins, sisters. Anybody you would meet on the street, you wouldn't think you wouldn't think twice about them being a prisoner. So it came time where we could interview uh, particular inmates, and we got paired with two ladies 
and they came from completely different backgrounds. Uh, the first lady, her name was Samantha, she grew up on, a, on the Arapaho Indian Reservation over in Riverton, Wyoming. Uh, the second lady, Katie, she grew up in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, Katie came from a very wealthy background. She had a master's degree in pharmacy and Samantha didn't appear to have much education um, other, uh, beyond high school. And you know, talking with these women, asking these two different women all these different questions that we had as you know prompts about class and about you know their their background and how they felt on you know relevant issues of uh, in the country. You really got a sense that yeah, these you know they they completely different. You know, just night and day difference in their backgrounds, but. After thinking about it, and I, I probably didn't realize it until after we were already on, on the way home or, you know, started working on this project, you know, these women for having totally different backgrounds and, you know, total, totally different views on life, because of the situations that they had found themselves in, you know, their, their fault or not, or, you know, that's, that's you know, that, that can be disputed, but the point is, they found themselves in a situation where, they shared more in common with each other than I perhaps did with anybody else in, in the whole class um, of my peers. You know, they, they're going through something, they're enduring something together that only people in that situation will ever understand. Before our trip to Lusk, our thoughts and opinions didn't differ that much from the stereotypes that were addressed by the two gentlemen in the beginning of this video. But after our trip, and after making this video, our thoughts and feelings on, on this topic have changed quite drastically. How can these people still function knowing that everything has been taken away from them? How can they live with the guilt of their decisions or the anger at someone else's? How can these people make the monotony of prison their new normal life when they seemingly have nothing to live for? Maybe this relates to something deeper. Maybe this relates to the fact that the material things we need to be happy are not necessary. Maybe there is something more human at play. A deeper understanding of what it means to endure what could quite possibly be a living hell. Maybe it takes something like prison to prove to ourselves, to prove that even in prison, you are never alone. Okay, so the video obviously started with this really essentialist view of women, right? As I said, um, they're all in lesbian relationships, they're all cutified into a sisterly group. Um, and most people don't realize, as you can tell from those two gentlemen's reactions, that at least 30% of all women in US prisons, probably higher, have suffered sexual or physical abuse prior to entering prison. And it's clear that prison conditions can revive trauma and mental health conditions. It's hardly a great place for a lesbian meetup or a fun girls club atmosphere. Um, but through the simple act of spending an hour with two inmates, the makers of this video were able to name their previous stereotypes and to break with them. They chose to end their video saying, even in prison, we are never fully alone, a testament to our interdependence and our reliance on social capital in all circumstances. So it's heartening to see students responding to the woman they met as the diverse and multifaceted people they are. Their sentence, their crime, their court-ordered number, it's just a part of them. Other lessons about the environment were learned on the spot that day. Lessons I had not anticipated myself. Okay, so for instance, when we walked into the prison, when I went earlier, months earlier, my prison, my prison entry was smooth. But of course, there were 24 of us, and we got inside the... Um, the, the building, and we got an immediate lesson in Foucauldian biopolitical management. The prison had mistakenly sent me an old memo of what to wear. On that memo, there was no mention that shorts were not allowed. So one of my male students walked in wearing long shorts. Instantly, the male corrections officer spoke to him harshly. Go back to the bus. You're spending the afternoon in the bus. You're not allowed in here because you're wearing shorts. How could you wear the wrong thing? Now, after a minute or two, I mean, this really got our attention. We just sat in a bus for two and a half hours, right? Um, after a minute or two, the officer relented. 
but he emphasized from the, his point of view, we weren't there to spend the afternoon to get educated. We were a security risk, and we had just made his afternoon a lot crappier than it would have been otherwise. Now, the entire situation and the guard's exact statements were repeated 10 minutes later when the last student, a male student who happened to be on crutches, came in and he also was wearing long shorts. So once again, told to go back to the bus, he's not going to get to come in. Even though he was doing this in front of all of us watching who had already seen him relent. This taught me that just as the inmates' routine is really structured and scripted, so is that of the officers, and their training almost makes them robo robotic in situations like this. So obviously that illustrates different priorities for different people in a prison setting. The tour itself also revealed strong philosophical differences between employees of the criminal justice system and visitors who are coming at it from a human rights angle. Our tour leader was a staff member, and she's a very hard-working hard woman, so my job here is, today is not to badmouth her. I can't give you a full picture of her. I do want to give you, though, a glimpse of some of the moments on the tour that made me very aware of our different positions. So she asked me our purpose. When I answered to find things in common with the inmates and consider the solidarity we can build between people on the inside and the outside, she kept her face perfectly immobile, but her eyes frowned at me. She stated, you all have nothing in common with these people. My main message to you is do not do drugs and especially don't do meth. And while I honor and respect that she had her own message to share with us, um, it was really clear to me that she couldn't relate to our group being anything more than sort of a scared straight type of group, right? Like we got to scare them straight. Um, and later in the tour, she emphasized she was happy we were there because we could see how our taxpayer dollars were being wisely spent. So again, coming from a much more material, um, like sort of, yeah, I guess practical angle. Um, another part that was really problematic for me was the way she referred to um, lesbian desire. So at one point, she just kind of whirled around and said, you have all heard of gay for the stay, right? We all nodded. Well, she said, we have to protect people since some women are preying on others while they're in here. We have a strictly no-touching policy. And there's a number of practical reasons why there's phys limited physical contact between people in a prison setting. But the characterization of all romantic and sexual feelings between women who live together, remember, live together sometimes for decades, to that of predator and prey was strikingly biased. And it kind of got, you know, it gave me the vibe of this 1950s poster, this is a 1956 movie, where you can just see, I mean, I haven't seen the movie, but you can just see from the positioning of the woman that women in prison are sexualized and further, they're sexualized as sort of um, aggressive people, right? Aggressive sexual um, pe beings, if you will. And the other reason I found it disturbing, of course, is that the most recent and, th and thorough scholarship about women's prisons indicates that romantic and sexual contact between women in women's prisons, the vast majority, is consensual. Another time we had a philosophical clash was that our tour leader was trying to illustrate how to think like a staff member. So what happened was she put us close together in a really tiny room. We were near the segregated unit. It was a very small space and it was very, very warm. She talked to us for 10 minutes. And then at that point she said, okay, who here wants to get out of this little room? And most people raised their hand. And she said, okay, who can take, you know, take this for another 10, 15 minutes? A couple of my young women raised their hands. And that's when she said, well, now I'm suspicious of you. Like you should not, that's, that's not normal. You should want to get out of here. Later, something similar happened. She strategically placed us near a mur mural, and then she said, there's some really fine details in there I want you to look at. And she watched who crowded around the mural. Well, everybody crowded around the mural except for stu two students. Then she said to everybody, she pointed them out as people she would be most likely to keep her eyes on because they were not making an effort to blend in. In both situations, I saw how personality traits were being read and overly simplified as predictors of antisocial behavior. And so that made me very conscious of how the training must cultivate that mindset. I was particularly sensitive to these readings because 
the two people she singled out by the mural happened to be one of my only ethnic minority students and the only student in the class who had a documented learning difference. And so I just couldn't help but think, my gosh, don't you realize there could be some other reasons that they're already feeling a little bit you know, isolated or maybe just a little bit more wary? <clears throat> So since the time of this visit, I've had the chance to carry out hour-long interviews with 20 inmates as part of a formal research project with my colleagues. And I will have a total of 70 interviews with both for currently and formerly incarcerated women um, by the end of the summer. By eliciting women's own perspectives on broad themes of what they think they'll need upon community re-entry and how the community can help them to achieve their goals, we will offer evidence-based recommendations as to how Wyoming might better respond to some of the needs of its most vulnerable citizens. It's exciting to be able to inform you that this valuable work, which was supported by the Social Justice Research Center, has been welcomed by the State's Department of Corrections, and that's very unusual. They have really been um, very good about helping us to get in and also telling us they want a report from us. So that suggests our state does not assume everything's already optimal and shows their openness to ev evidence-based suggestions. Preliminary findings from these interviews suggest if we do put greater effort into educational and rehabilitation type of programs, then we will ease people's transition into a productive and fulfilling life. Um, I'm just going to sort of be a tease and say, you know, stay tuned next, for next year's symposium because I think we'll have uh, the chance to present our results then. Um, because this work is ongoing, I'm not going to tie things up with a neat little bow. I just want to say to the educators in the audience, and actually I think we're all educators, because if you stop and think about it, every time you ask someone a question or get someone to think about something in a different way, you're educating them. But I want to sort of reiterate to you all that the importance of taking students from the abstract to the real. It's, it's so easy to overgeneralize about this population until you meet them. The world is a messy place, and in most cases, poverty, low social capital and abuse shadow women who later commit crimes. Um, that's not an excuse for their crimes, but it is a reminder that those who make mistakes are very human and very real. Um, and it's, it's really by sitting down with uh, people from a marginalized group that you can begin to see their complexity. So I'm going to leave you with a quote from the Velotin Rabbit. Once you are real, you can't be ugly, except to people who don't understand. Once you are real, you can't become unreal again. It lasts for always. Thank you. All right, I guess we'll get started. Thank you for coming to our presentation today. My name is Laura Weatherford and I work for Wyoming Equality. Uh, my name is Melanie Vigil and I work for the ACLU and I work here in Cheyenne. My name is Sarah Burlingame and until recently I worked for the Human Rights Campaign and I'm in Cheyenne. Hmm. All right, so um, first of all, I guess what we want to do is kind of just recap this last legislative session. Um, I spoke a little bit about it on the marriage equality panel yesterday, but I think this is an opportunity for us to kind of dive deeper and <clears throat> talk about what happened, what went right, <clears throat> what went wrong, and um, just looking forward to the future. So if you already know this, um, I apologize, but bear with me. It is kind of a complicated process. Um, I'm just going to explain how the Wyoming legislature works. Um, so 
a bill has to be referred to a committee and the committee is either in the House or the Senate. And then once, once it passes out of the House or the House committee or Senate committee, it'll go to um, the floor. And then on the floor, it has to pass three readings. So then when it passes those three readings, it'll get referred to the opposite chamber's um, committee. And there are a bunch of committees on both sides of um, both the Senate and the House. And uh, so it was funny because when my bill that I was working on passed out of the Senate, um, my parents thought that we were done. They're like, yeah, it passed. Is it gonna, the governor's gonna sign it, right? And I was like, no, we're only halfway done. <laughs> so um, once it passes out of that first chamber, then it'll have to pass another committee and then another three readings. And then if it passes all of that, then the governor will have a chance to sign it if he decides to. Um, so just keep that in the background. So this is a long process, but it actually happens really, really quickly. Um, because we are a citizen legislature, which means that our lawmakers only meet at a certain part of the year and for only a certain amount of time, um, these things happen super fast. So our general sessions are only 40 days long, um, and then our budget sessions are even shorter, and those are 20 days long. So <laughs> we don't have full-time lawmakers like some states do. Um, so everything happens so, so fast, um, like especially when there's 500 plus bills making their way through both chambers. Um, so the bill that we were working on was SF-115, which was uh, non-discrimination. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Um, and it got a lot of really great support. So what the bill did was basically it added um, LGBT people, so lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people as a protected class. So you couldn't be fired um, for being gay. You couldn't um, be denied public services, such as restaurants, um, hotels, things of that nature. And um, so you couldn't be fired. What's the other one? There's three. Housing. housing, thank you. <laughs> housing is a third. You couldn't be denied housing or evicted from your apartment um, because of your LGBT status. So uh, just a kind of a brief history. Um, I was a legislati legislative aide to Representative Connolly for about three years. Um, so back when I first started um, interning for her, she had brought the bill up. And back when we first started, um, the bill actually it didn't make it out of committee one year. Um, this was about four years ago. And then two years ago, it got out of a Senate committee and then it died on the Senate floor. So um, each year we brought it back, it progressed a little bit but not very much, it was, it's always a heartbreaking defeat when that happens. Um, but this year, this year was different. This year was really, really different. Um, it not only passed out of the Senate committee, but it passed th three readings on the Senate floor, and the final vote count on that was 24 to six. So we have never seen um, that happen before with this bill, and it was so, so exciting. Um, we had so much support around the state. And then um, it got to a House committee, and we were worried about the House um, in terms of vote count. We just weren't really sure where we stood, and the House was kind of a different ball game than the Senate. And um, it did get out of a House committee, but it ended up failing on first reading on the floor, and that vote was 33 to 26 with one excused. So that was really heartbreaking for all of us because we had put so much time and so much effort into this bill. Um, that was my primary job for the first two months of my position. Um, so that was really heartbreaking. But something that was different about SF-115 uh, this time around was we had a lot, of, um, a lot more strategy and a lot more support from coalitions. So we had several coalition partners, um, one being Protect Working Wyoming and the other one being Compete Wyoming. So <clears throat> these groups kind of um, garnered support around the state from different businesses like the Lodging Association, the Wyoming Association of Mus Municipalities, um, the Wyoming Association of Churches. So having all of these different uh, groups and businesses and organizations around the state coming out in support for this bill was really monumental. Um, we couldn't have done it without that support. And um, also another really big thing that really helped us out was uh, the media. 
the media was very supportive um, of us throughout the entire uh, process of the bill. So the Casper Star Tribune uh, ran a, a million awesome articles for us, and um, the Laramie Boomerang here in town is really supportive. And so that was all really positive. Um, and it's got, like I said, it went further than it ever had before. Um, so we're hoping now uh, to bring this bill back again in 2017 and get it passed for good because it's time and we're ready and the momentum is there. And now that we have marriage equality, it doesn't make any sense for us to be fired for being who we are. So that's really what we're pushing to right now. Um, but in terms of kind of the debate, both in Wyoming and especially in the legislature for this session was really interesting. So the Senate had a lot of awesome debate. You can actually um, listen to the archives on, um, it's like legisweb.com. Yeah, it's, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, if anyone's interested, I can get that for you. Um, it's really great. It was re we had some awesome testimony um, from not only Democrats, but also Republicans as well. Because for this kind of a social issue, uh, we need support from Republicans, Democrats, conservatives, every type of way you identify politically, we needed that support. So that was awesome. But um, the House debate was a little bit different. <laughs> well, a lot of it different. Um, <laughs> We have some interesting folks as elected officials here in the state of Wyoming, and um, that's about all I'll say about that. And um, <laughs> so, yeah, but otherwise, the Senate was kind of our top-notch um, chamber there. And so, but that being said, so the opposition was super well organized. That's why it's so important that we are organized on our side, um, in order to get something like this passed, because for every one of us, there's a few of them, um, it seemed like, in the legislature. And I know that's not true in reality in Wyoming, but that's kind of what happened there towards the end, which was really unfortunate. Um, so they were saying things like, being gay is a choice, and why would we want to protect people's choices of that nature, and things like that. And, um, but for the most part, it was all the religious argument. Um, it was all, well, it just the crazy, the riffraff stuff we've been seeing in Indiana. There was a lot of that um, at the legislature. There was a lot of the bathroom argument. We call it the bathroom scare, where we're going to have to start sharing bathrooms with all these transgender people. It's like there was really good testimony from our former attorney general, and it was like, well, you already are. <laughs> so I don't, yeah, you already are, so that shouldn't be a problem. Um, but all of that to say that uh, we've progressed so much even over the last five years and we really need the continued support um, both from our citizens and from our allies and pretty much anywhere we can get it. Um, I'm going to hand off the mic to Laura who's going to talk to us a little bit about where we are now and where we're going. Thank you. All right, so as she mentioned, it didn't quite pass at the state level but we did get 50 lawmakers to vote for it, which is huge. That was phenomenal, um, new this year. And so we're trying to kind of capitalize off of all that support and pass local ordinances, because this is a very important issue. Um, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender people need these protections. So since it didn't pass at the state level, we're going around to local municipalities and trying to get it passed. So Laramie is kind of the shining star in that regard. Um, there's a really good grassroots group here in Laramie that has got this, the ball rolling since last summer is when they started drafting the ordinance, talking to businesses, writing to the newspaper about getting these protections in place here in Laramie. Um, and so just this week, actually, it passed first reading. So we have a non-discrimination ordinance that's going through the city council right now. And the awesome thing is the room was packed. The hallways were packed. It was so many people were there. And so at one point, um, Will, kind of the one who's spearheading this effort, he said, those of you who are here to support it, please stand up. And the whole room stood up. There was not one person there opposed to this. And so I think that highlights how important this is. These are real people, these are real lives, and it's not fair to be fired for who you are. Um, and so that's essentially what these non-discrimination ordinances do. So although the local ordinance, ordinance is a little different than the state bill, 
um, it's kind of the same idea that in employment, housing, and public accommodations, you can't be discriminated against for who you are. Um, and so the Laramie Ordinance, we essentially, at first it just had public accommodations for city-owned buildings and businesses. And so we actually got put back into it, public accommodations with, with private businesses too. So grocery stores, going to restaurants, all those things. So you can't be kicked out just because you're gay or transgender. And so, but in the law, it's important to note, it's striking a balance. So if you're being a jerk, you know, if you're throwing apples in the grocery store, or if you're at the restaurant screaming, you know, cuss words or something, you can still be kicked out. So these aren't unduly protections, right? You have to still... If you're qualified, you're not going to be fired from the, your job. But if you stop showing up to work, you can't, you know, then say, well, you can't fire me because I'm gay. So it still protects employers, because that's an argument some people will be, you know, they'll bring up. They'll say, well, as an employer, I don't like this. So it's just striking a balance. It's protecting people who aren't protected right now, and that's really important. So it's good for business. It's good for people's lives. It's not fair that there's discrimination right now. Nobody likes discrimination. Um, so like I said in Laramie, it just passed first reading. I think the culture here is very accepting. Um, and I think why it's really important in Laramie is there's kind of this reputation of being a hating town, right, with the hate crime. And someone highlighted that in testimony at the city council. They said, that's not who Laramie is. And so by passing this ordinance, we're showing the nation, we accept you for who you are. We love you. We're a diverse little town. Um, so I think it'd be really cool if the first um, town in Wyoming could be Laramie to pass this. Because right now, 0% of Wyoming has these protections in place. And that's really sad. Only nine states in the whole nation have 0% of their population protected in housing, employment, and public accommodations. Um, so I guess that's mostly what we're working on. We're going to be going across the whole state trying to get these in place because, of course, it'd be great to have it here in Laramie, but there are LGBT people in the whole state, right? There are almost 9,000 who have no protections right now, and that's way too many people um, to be discriminated against. So the ways that you can get involved, um, as Sarah mentioned, sadly, so the HRC, she worked for the HRC, they have pulled out of Wyoming, and now the ACLU, They've closed their Wyoming chapter too. So it's really heartbreaking. Yeah, <laughs> sorry to rub salt in the wound. <laughs> Those are the sad facts. And so Wyoming equality is kind of the lone man standing. Um, and so we, unfortunately, we're, we're a nonprofit and so we have small funds, right? So one way that you can definitely help is by donating to us. And I have some donation cards if you want to help us afterward. And if you sign up for a monthly recurring, you get free membership because we really, we would love your donations. Even just a dollar, if that's all you can do, to try to help us fund traveling, going around and talking to people, educating people on discrimination and why this matters. And then you can also write letters to the editor. You can talk, you can share your opinion and talk about why this matters. You can share stories of discrimination. You can go talk to business leaders and tell them why this matters, how it's good for them as business people. At the city council meeting, there was a myriad of people. There were teachers, business owners, parents, religious people, students, um, and then LGBT people themselves. So there's broad support. In a survey that we conducted earlier, um, or I guess at the end of last year, actually, we found that 78% of the respondents said, my religious faith teaches me that homosexuality is wrong, but I do not think that means people should be fired simply based on someone's sexual orientation or gender identity. So even with, she was talking about some of the religious arguments that people brought up, even among those people, almost 80% say you shouldn't be fired based on who you are. And then aside from that, a lot of people don't even agree with homosexuality being wrong, right? This is who we are. You're a beautiful person as you are. 96% um, of people agree that in America, job hiring decisions should be made based on a person's experience, abilities, and performance, not based on their sexual orientation or gender identity. And so the fact is, protecting people from discrimination, including people who are gay or transgender, is about treating others as we want to be treated. It's not for us to judge. Even though we may have different beliefs, what's important is focusing on what we have in common, taking pride in our work, respecting coworkers, and getting the job done. And so now I'll pass it over to Sarah. She did a lot of the faith work, which is very important and vital in passing these. Thanks, Laura. 
I just want to say how much I love how much the Central GSA is representing at Shepherd Symposium. It's so awesome. I remember when you guys were tiny. I know you guys, I, I don't know how wrong it is to say you dominate Shepherd Symposium, but it's, it's awesome to see. Um, so why is faith organizing so hard? Like, why is it so hard to talk to people uh, about their religion or to enter into conversations with people where you know they might tell you that who you are as a person isn't acceptable to God? Well, I think that answers the question, right? That's why it's so hard, because there's so much pain there. And so uh, when we do our workshops, when we, when we break out, I really want to talk about how you can have those hard conversations, how you can show up when you're entering into a space where maybe you've, you, you've felt a lot of pain before, because it's the most important thing we can do. Like, I believe in data, I believe in research, I believe in surveys, like those are so good, they're, they're amazing, but they don't change people's minds the way showing up and letting them hear your story does. So in this last legislative session, you know, these guys are amazing and, you know, they know the numbers and they know who we need to get and, and who needs to be circled back around and connected with. And when I look at it, I just see evangelical, Mormon, Baptist, evangelical. Like, I see it as this faith picture. And it's very hard for me <laughs> to... Um, step back and realize that, of course, there are other things at play because what I see is so strongly correlated to people's core religious beliefs. So, for instance, a lot of people don't know that the senator who ended up co-sponsoring um, this legislation is Drew Perkins, and he is a devout LDS man from Casper, cradle, born in the covenant, Mormon man, very serious about his faith and his religion, and he became a co-sponsor and he spoke passionately on the floor, he spoke passionately to his fellow legislators about the need to pass non-discrimination legislation in Wyoming. So why did a Mormon do that? Did he do it because he lost his faith? Or did he do it because he was pushing back from his faith? He didn't. He did it grounded in his faith. And that's a story that some of us have a hard time hearing because we make an assumption when people step out into these social justice spaces, when they step out and are advocates for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer people, that they must be leaving behind their faith. But Senator Perkins made it very clear that this was an embrace of his faith. And a couple of things helped make that happen. And I think we can see the way we can use that and we, and we can do the same thing in Wyoming. In Utah in, um, I think it was 2012, uh, two gay men were holding hands on the city mall. And I think maybe there was, this is disputed, but maybe there was a little smooch in there. But it wasn't porn. <laughs> And it wasn't, uh, uh, you know, assless chaps out on the quad saying, check me out. It was two men holding hands. They ended up getting tackled and restrained and kicked off because that was LDS church property. And the queer community in Salt Lake said, oh, absolutely not. <laughs> you have crossed a line. <laughs> like, folks need to be able to hold hands. Like, that, that's unacceptable. So, um... Troy Williams, who's now the executive director of Equality Utah, he was like, posse up, people. We're going to get 10,000 queer people down here on the you know, temple grounds to say, stop treating us like that. And he was right. You know, direct action has a powerful place. You know, at, raise your hand if you've ever been to a protest. Yeah, that feels good, right? It feels good to show up to have solidarity, to show people like, we're not going to take this. So that's super important. But having hard conversations is also super important. And I know the Central GSA people know how important hard conversations are. So that was the other piece. Yes, they showed up on Temple Square. Yes, they protested. I was there, it was super fun. <laughs> uh, but they also said, we need to be in conversation. We need to talk to each other. And so that's what they started doing. And at first, it almost stalled out because they couldn't find a place to meet because the queer folks were not going to church headquarters. And the church folks were not going to queer headquarters. 
And so they had to find a third place. They had to find this house that this woman had a very luxurious home where the Romneys would come to stay, said, y'all can come use my house. And they're like, nice, there will be good food served and this beautiful view, we'll do that. And they had a very gentle, low bar, like we're not gonna solve the church and queer issues today conversation, right? To say, this is who I am, this is what my story is, could you just listen to it? Could you just hear my story? Could you just hear me tell you what it was like for me to grow up in the church, to go through reparation therapy, to hear a message in my young men's telling me that maybe I was a son of perdition, maybe I wasn't a beloved child of my heavenly parents. Could you just hear how that felt for me? And the church officials did. And the church officials got to tell their story. And they got to say, we're so afraid. We're afraid that our religion is gonna be torn apart. We're afraid that everything that we believe in is gonna be taken from us. We believe that this signals the last days. We believe you're coming and the apocalypse is coming on its heels and you're bringing it to our door. So they had to really listen to each other. And I, I just wanted to share that story with you to say that like, yes, Drew Perkins stood up and said, I support this legislation. Yes, he was an advocate for it, but that conversation, th that, that advocacy on his part, it doesn't happen without that conversation that happened in Salt Lake. Because that's what promoted the church to say, okay, okay, there are some, there are some areas we can meet. There are some areas that, that we can see eye to eye here. And um, non-discrimination is gonna be one of them. So the church had a press conference and they said, we support non-discrimination. We also want this intense version of religious freedom codified in the law too. We wanna to make sure that you're not gonna come after our temples, you're not gonna come after our, our sacred spaces and change them. That's really important to us. And that conversation's still happening, right? But w without those people saying, we can sit down and talk to each other, we don't get a Mormon man in, in Wyoming saying, I can be an advocate for this. And um, bef I don't wanna take up too much of your time, but before we break into our workshops, I wanna tell you that I'm good with Mormons because I love Mormons. <laughs> like, uh, Mormons never hurt me. Um, I'm good with Catholics. I go to mass and I meet with um, a Catholic bishop, or I, I do meet with a Catholic bishop. I mostly meet with a Catholic priest. That's more my pay grade. Um, and I've just found so much uh, beautiful uh, connection there. But I grew up a Baha'i. More Baha'is in the room? Any Baha'i? I'm just kidding. There's never any Baha'is. Um, <laughs> it's an offshoot of Islam. And uh, I grew up in the Intermountain West, like metropolitan places like Winnemucca, Nevada, Golconda, Nevada, Barstow, California. So not a lot of Baha'is there, but lots of evangelicals. And um, so I, I don't go to evangelical services. I don't, I don't reach out to evangelicals the same way I reach out to Catholics and the way I reach out to Mormons. Because even as a 39-year-old grown-ass adult, I still think they're gonna send me running home to my mom because I didn't accept Jesus Christ as my personal savior and I'm going to hell. I know that's not true, but th there's a reason why meeting with evangelicals is hard for me. But yesterday I met with an evangelical minister who's the minister of uh, Cheyenne Hills in, in Cheyenne. And I told him, I gotta tell you, your people were not very good to me on the playground. <laughs> and uh, he did not take responsibility for every childhood hurt that I had had on behalf of evangelicals, which I, I, I thought was not generous of him. Um, <laughs> but we did have a good conversation because it started from a very honest place where I said, we're not gonna agree on everything. Like, we're gonna walk away from this and you might still think that there's no room in God's plan for, for same-sex marriage. And I might think there's no room on my queer boat <laughs> for that theology, you know? We, we, we might see this very differently and that's all right, but let's see if we can find the places where we can meet. 
and, because what happened in that uh, legislative session was when I heard the Mormons talk, when I heard the Catholics talk, I understood their language and I knew what they were saying. Whether we agreed or disagreed, I felt like we were in the same conversation. And when I heard the evangelicals talk, I thought, if we want to find a point of commonality, I need to go back to the alphabet. Like, that's where we would need to start to find a point of connection. We are so distant, I honestly don't believe that you think I'm human the same way you're human. And that's a hard place to get any work done together when we really don't see each other as fundamentally human. So that's the conversation that's starting. And that's um, what I hope everyone here feels like they might have some, some calling to do. If religion has hurt you so badly that the idea of like talking to your ecclesiastical leader or talking to your homophobe uncle at Christmas, always do that. That's the best. Um, if that is just so painful because you know like that is going to be a message that just like bludgeons you, don't do it. Pass the baton to somebody who they do feel called to do that. Like I'm not saying that religious organizing, um, speaking in faith communities needs to be everybody's thing. It doesn't. I mean, for some people, that's um, never, that's never going to be useful. It's always just going to be a stick to, to, to bludgeon yourself with. F find the other thing. Making signs for protests. That's a good skill. That's a, that's a great way to add to the, the conversation. But if it is, if that is your thing, then I would say, you know, particularly before, you know, these ordinances come up in whatever towns, you know, we live in around Wyoming for non-discrimination, um, before this non-discrimination comes up in the legislature, or whatever thing it is that affects queer lives, have a conversation with your ecclesiastical leaders, have a conversation with that homophobe uncle, and show up. And don't necessarily give them a bunch of statistics, although statistics sometimes really do help. I'm not bad-mouthing statistics. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is a safe space, <laughs> thank God. Um, but saying, here's my story, and really claiming it. Like, if you, have, if you have a testimony of Jesus Christ, and you know that Jesus Christ is cool with queerness, claim that. Share it with somebody. Tell them. If you have a testimony of Zenu, the Scientology overlord, and you know that queerness, if being gay, being lesbian, being transgender, is not at odds with that, claim that story. Don't tell somebody else's story. Tell, tell your story. Because Wyoming needs it. Like, we need five more votes <laughs> in that legislature. And there are people sitting there who think that they don't know that gay people, that lesbians, bisexual people, transgender people, are human the same way they are. So I hope that you'll prove them wrong. Well, I think this wraps up that section. I feel like crying in a good way. Uh, this happy circle. Uh, <laughs> um, so I think that, um, it, does anyone have any questions, first of all? Yeah. Hell freezes over comment that we all read about in the newspaper. If you don't mind revisiting that moment for just a second. Oh, Harlan hell freezes over Edmonds. <laughs> Is that what you're doing? Yeah, I'll tell it. I was there. I was in the front row. I got a front row seat. Um, yeah, so they were coming to the very, so um, when a committee sees a bill and votes on a bill, they work the bill. And a bill can be anywhere from one page to 5,000 pages or whatever. But um, they were on the very last page of the bill, and on the last page of all bills, it says um, this bill or law will go into effect on July 1st of the following year or whatever. And so Harlan Edmonds um, out of Cheyenne, he 
proposed an amendment that the bill go into effect and replace July 1st or whatever that date was with when hell freezes over. Um, <laughs> and he promptly got ejected out of the committee meeting. Yes! <laughs> Woo! By a Mormon, yes. Yes, Elaine, um, Representative Elaine Harvey. She um, deserves all the credit where credit is due in the way that she conducted herself for that committee meeting and um, in, just in general as a human being. Um, it was really great. So, well, yeah, that's what happened. There's a lot of media backlash for that. I, I feel like I want to go like on a truth tour around the state and like tell everybody this piece that I felt like was missing from the coverage of it, that Representative Edmonds' very first co or comment um, when they opened it up was, it looks sincere, right? He's flipping through, saying, I'm, I'm, I see that you have language for lesbian and bisexual and transgender. I don't see anything that addresses pedophiles. Was that an oversight? Or were you hoping to add them in later? Can you tell me more about that? So like the contempt that he showed, right? And just like, it's, it's foul, like it's so vile. Like, and putting it across as though this, no, just a sincere, like I noticed you didn't mention pedophiles. No, no, no pedophiles, okay. You know, like from the beginning, Representative Harvey said like, that won't fly. Like, that's not going to happen. And, and I feel like sometimes in the coverage that it looked like, oh, you know, he just made this comment and he meant it as a joke, and she's such a hard ass, she ejected him. She's a boss. Like, she is a boss. She did just eject him. But I, I feel like it's important to see that, like, what led up to it. And afterwards she said, you know, people didn't see this because, like, I cut my mic and I, like, went behind my hand to him. But I said, you're on thin ice. You need to stop now. <laughs> So he was warned, and he knew he was warned. Do you have a question? Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, because earlier you were talking about uh, how HRC left Wyoming, and I'm not sure if there were like details on that on the internet, but I didn't know the story on that deal. So if somebody could explain that to me, why they <laughs> left. I'm gonna throw something. <laughs> This is being recorded, right? So here's the truth about living in Wyoming. We're the smallest state in the country. Yeah. And um, population-wise, heart-wise, we're the biggest. And by that I mean diabetes and heart disease. No. Um, that's terrible. Uh, When HRC came into Wyoming, they said, look, we've got a bad reputation. We've got a bad reputation on trans issues because we've gotten that wrong before. And the woman who hired me, Sharon Groves, who's just a goddess among humans and is amazing, and she does this work nationally, globally, and she gets evangelicals to change their minds, which is amazing. We have a bad reputation at the HRC because we fly in when there's a problem. And we're like, boom, we're the HRC. Check out our bumper stickers. Check out our swag. Um, oh, what's that, Lady Gaga? Yeah, she's with us, you know? Um, and that doesn't work, like in small towns. We're like, hey, we've been, we've been doing this. We've been doing this for a while. You know, we, we have our own process. We have our own thing that's happening here. Like, a DC company can't come in from DC, you know, to a little town in Wyoming and say, hey, here's how you do your queerness. They're like, B word, we got this. Um, so they said, yeah, we, we, we're, we're gonna change that. Like, that needs to not happen anymore. Um, we really wanna invest in Wyoming and there's this project called Project One America. We chose three states in the South, um, the worst states, you know, they're like, here's where it's the hardest, here's where it's the worst. Oh, we should add Wyoming and um, Nebraska to that. Thank you. <laughs> um, so that was the plan. And then Alabama, um, Arkansas, and Indiana kind of blew up with um, some, some bad laws. And they said, oh, looks like we got to go there. And we said, whoa, 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 wait. 
We have t-shirts. Remember you guys made us t-shirts. They say, they're sitting at lawyer's office. <laughs> There's hundreds of them. They say HRC, Equality Wyoming. Is HRC like not gonna kick around? Not gonna like redo the contract or? No, they're not. Um, that's always gonna be the drawback of working with like national, uh, I'll let Melanie talk about the ACLU if she wants to. <laughs> um, you, if you're doing community organizing, be rooted in your community. You know, uh, the humiliating truth is the HRC will come back, ACLU will come back, and we'll hand over our work to them. Which is a little bit humiliating, right? Like, we'd love to be all stand and deliver and like, screw you, you weren't there for us when you needed us. But the truth is we, we're small and we always need the help. Um, but stay grounded in your community. One more question? Do you want to talk about the ACLU? Oh. Oh, um, yeah. So, <laughs> um, yeah, great way to wrap up. Um, but there's a pot of positive note at the end, so it's fine. Um, yeah, so I, I worked for the ACLU of Wyoming. Um, there were uh, three really great um, colleagues that I had, and I drove to Cheyenne every day. Um, and it was great. I mean, I didn't mind the commute because of that, because they were so awesome and provided me with so much support. And they worked so endlessly and tire tirelessly to make my position a re reality. Um, I'm funded under a grant, a separate grant, and, um, but my like, head organization is the ACLU, and that's who I'm employed by. And, um, you know, the ACLU is, uh, as a national organization, is kind of... Um, I guess restructuring and um, that throws some budget things uh, in there in the equation there and um, so Wyoming was hit by some of the some of the cuts some of the layoffs this round and um, so we no longer have an office in Cheyenne um, I am confident that there will be another position um, that the ACLU opens up here in Wyoming but for right now I'm the only one um, and it's because I'm mostly funded under a grant. Um, so that was pretty heartbreaking. It's been a really hard two weeks. A lot of the really, really important work that the ACLU of Wyoming has done, um, that's, you know, that's halted, and I'm not really sure what, what's going to happen. Um, as my supervisor kind of was saying last week, you know, when prisoners call, call us and say, uh, calls with a problem or a civil rights violation, and we tell them, hey, our doors are closing, we're not gonna be here anymore, and they say, well, who's here to help me? Um, a, lot of, a lot of the times the answer is, well, nobody, because we are some of the only people in the state working on um, those issues. So it's a really hard time um, for, for progressive organizations in the state right now, but I am confident um, that, I'm, I'm still wildly excited and fortunate to be able to keep doing the work that I'm doing. Um, this hopefully won't hinder the work that I'm doing. I'm so, so grateful. Um, Laramie non-discrimination ordinance is rolling on now and we don't have any plans of stopping anytime soon. So if, if all of that <laughs> is to say that we're still here and we're still on the ground working, then I think that's a positive way to end. So. I guess we have to wrap up. <laughs> Yeah, thank you.